Often water ceremonies will involve and include the youth who pack the ceremonial water down to the water body and we all collectively put our prayers and thoughts and feelings and intentions into the water and the youth carry the water down and put it into the bigger water body. And the emphasis is on the respect of water and the respect of water within us also. Including Indigenous peoples and respecting Indigenous peoples' rights and self-determination in environmental governance is fundamental to advancing reconciliation in Canada. Until Indigenous peoples and their relationships with water and the other elements of the environment are respected, I don't think that we can say that we're advancing reconciliation. Welcome to another episode of What's the Big Idea with University of Manitoba President Michael Benarosh in conversation with some of today's big thinkers. Together, they'll unpack the big idea their work explores. With topics ranging from astrophysics to social justice, these diverse voices tell us how the UM community is contributing to the cultural, social, and economic well-being of the people of Manitoba, Canada, and the world. In today's episode, Michael sits down with Dr. Nicole Wilson, Canada Research Chair in Arctic Environmental Change and Governance. Together, they'll discuss how Canada can better understand, govern, and enhance Indigenous self-determination over water rights. What a pleasure it is to sit down with you today, Nicole. Your work looks at the role of Indigenous peoples in self-determination and how that connects to environmental governance in the Arctic. And what's intriguing is that as a Canada Research Chair, you view this work through the lens of reconciliation. And so I'm really excited to learn more about your work and, and your thoughts. One of the questions I've been asking all of the participants to start the conversation is, what's your big idea? The big idea behind my research is that Canada cannot be a just or, or thriving nation without respecting Indigenous water rights and relationships. Now, I'm a person of settler origin, and so there's a, a lot of Indigenous thinkers who do work on this, but I think it's also a responsibility of non-Indigenous peoples to take that up. Canada, we have about 20% of the fresh water in the world, and so water governance is, is very important. Currently, we have a situation where Indigenous peoples are excluded from colonial water governance frameworks, and I think it's really important to address that in order to improve overall water sustainability in Canada. And certainly, as you say, we have 20% of the fresh water in the world, and so this is not only going to be a big issue in the future, but it's, a, it's an important issue right now for Canada. There's a lot of terms and definitions that maybe bring kind of a colonial mindset to some of the terms around water, around the Indigenous relationships. So I thought maybe we could start with some definitions. First, what do you mean by Indigenous rights and their relationships with water? What I mean by Indigenous rights and water relationships is that Indigenous peoples have distinct relationships with water that center on this idea that water is alive, water is a relative, it has spirit, which is just very different than in kind of Western or colonial understandings how we think about water, often just as H2O, as a material substance. And it has implications for understandings of how we treat water. So when we think of water as a material substance, it's something that's just available for human use, something that we can manage and exploit. But when thinking of water as a relative, very different relationships kind of flow from that in terms of thinking more on the end of responsibility. So Indigenous peoples, although it's Indigenous peoples are very diverse, and so we never want to take a pan-Indigenous approach, but in many cases I've learned that it's common to think of water as a relative and that people have reciprocal responsibilities to that water. So it's not just thinking about rights, but at the same time to acknowledge that Indigenous peoples do have have inherent water rights that flow from these relationships and that currently the situation in Canada is that these are not really acknowledged by colonial governments, by the Canadian government. And so, yeah, I'm talking about a very different understanding of water and a different kind of type of governance system that flows from that. And so what would it mean for Canada to respect those rights and relationships? 
For Canada to respect those relationships, I think it's, again, acknowledging that Indigenous peoples have these inherent rights. The current situation in Canada is there's something called crown jurisdiction over water. It just sort of assumes that what that means is that the government owns all of the water in Canada. And this comes from, you know, our, our history with the British crown. And it doesn't acknowledge that Indigenous peoples should have the ability to make decisions about you know, waters within their territories in a manner that is consistent with their relationships to water. I think we see a lot more interest in including Indigenous knowledge in things and in decision-making processes, and, and that is very important. But it's also about moving beyond that to rethink the decision-making processes themselves. There's a lot of uh, Indigenous legal scholars who are thinking about this and, you know, working with Indigenous partners um, outside of academia to look at potential models for this. Some of the people whose work I'm really inspired by are uh, Métis Anishinaabe scholar M.A. Kraft, who's at the University of Ottawa, as well as Anishinaabe scholar Deborah McGregor at York. They're kind of my water heroes, <laughs> I would okay. say. So, Just a couple more, in some sense, definitions or clarifications so that people listening today can kind of understand where you're coming from. How do you define Indigenous self-determination? I understand Indigenous self-determination as being about the ability to have control over their own institutions, their own uh, territories, the resources within those territories, their culture, language, things like that. So it's a broad understanding of, of being able to control those things in order to have a say in what their future is. And then related to that, environmental governance. Environmental governance is, is the whole system of institutions and decision-making processes and legislation that include various actors. And I think the importance of the term environmental governance is that we are going beyond just the state. So we're not just thinking about government, we're moving to governance to include a broader number of actors. Indigenous peoples aren't a new actor, but we are working to shift environmental governance to create expanded roles for their involvement. You've already talked about Indigenous people having a much more holistic understanding of, of water. And so with that in mind, what is the current situation with water governance and water security in the Arctic? When we think of the North and when we think of the Arctic, you know, what imagery comes to mind? You know, if you think of like National Geographic, it's usually ice, glaciers, sea ice, permafrost. So there's this image of the frozen Arctic and oh, of course, polar bears as well. But with climate change being one of the, the key issues you know, we have to think about the melting Arctic. And so there's a lot of shifts happening with fresh water in the Arctic that we need to pay attention to where we're moving towards a warmer, wetter Arctic. And so there's going to be changes with that regard. I also think the governance context there, water governance in Canada is jurisdictionally complex. Generally, there's a lot of overlap between different governments and things like that in terms of responsibilities that create challenges. But in the Arctic, you know, we also have to think about Arctic states, non-Arctic states, as well, though, very importantly, the significant role that Indigenous peoples play in governance in the region. And that's very much shaped by modern land claim agreements, which have been the focus of a lot of my research. So modern treaties or comprehensive land claim agreements were all negotiated after 1973. And while there are some outside of the Canadian North, like in British Columbia and even here in Manitoba, if you look at a map of where they're located, most of them are in the North. And so looking at uh, Yukon, Northwest Territories, Nunavut, they have a, a significant role and they contain some of the most explicit acknowledgements of Indigenous water rights in, in Canada. So I'm really, it was, you know, I think looking at water governance and security in the Arctic, it's important to think about those treaties and the implications of them. And where are we in Canada in terms of how we incorporate Indigenous views of water into our governance structures? Mm -hmm. I think uh, <laughs> we have a distance to go. But what gives me hope is that looking at the really like innovative ideas and models that Indigenous peoples themselves are creating, lots of proposals around co-developing legislation. Of course, it's complicated bringing multiple knowledge systems together, multiple nations together to co-create legislation with other governments. I think the focus right now is 
still very much on consultation rather than co-governance or shared decision making and still focusing too much probably just on integrating knowledge versus actually acknowledging indigenous governance systems. So can you speak about how environmental governance connects to indigenous reconciliation and how that will help to create a more just Canada? I think that including Indigenous peoples and respecting Indigenous peoples' rights and self-determination in environmental governance is fundamental to advancing reconciliation in Canada. It's one part of the picture. We can talk about reconciliation in all sorts of contexts, but I think until Indigenous peoples and their relationships with water and the other elements of the environment are respected, I don't think that we can say that we're advancing reconciliation. When you do look at water governance at the current time, we seem to be in the consultation stage or the studying stage of this, but really we need to move beyond that. Are there one or two things that you think could change very quickly or fundamental to really implement in terms of water governance? So one of the things that, you know, I mentioned before that I don't know about it changing quickly, but it's so fundamental is this idea of crown jurisdiction over water. Now, if you know about the process of changing the Canadian constitution, you know that that's why I'm saying it will not be fast. But I think advancing reconciliation would be much supported and improved through revisiting this just this assumption that Indigenous peoples don't have water rights or even on reserve people have to apply for licenses water licenses it's not assumed that any water came with reservations in the United States they have the winters doctrine which says that uh, reservations were were created with water rights to kind of accomplish the purpose of the reserve for economic purposes agriculture or, or whatever and here we don't even have that so starting to think about indigenous peoples as people with authority that can be shared with the Canadian government and not just maybe people who occasionally share their knowledge. In your research, you know, you take a community-based research method and you write a lot about the knowledge that the elders, the people of the Arctic have. I heard a speaker recently from Callowit who said that if you don't live there, if you don't do your research there, you won't really get to the truth of the North. And so... Can you expand on some of the knowledge that you've learned that has resulted from the fact that you've done your your work in the North? I've been working in the North, well, I guess starting in Alaska since about 2009, but working in Yukon since 2012 and have had the honor and just pleasure of being able to sit with many of the elders there and work alongside them over the years. And as a person of settler origin, my understanding of these things is still just, I think, even after 10 years, just at the the baby stage of kind of starting to understand some things. So I think coming to the work with a lot of humility is something that I want to acknowledge and, and just privilege as a settler individual. And so, yeah, some of the things, for example, that elders shared with me just are starting to click. Like, I'm like, oh, that's what you were saying, you know, initially thinking like, I'm going to go and talk to people about their knowledge of water and we'll learn more about environmental change. But it's so much more than that. It's, again, like you said, a very holistic understanding of the environment. And it's not just the environment, it's knowledge about law. It's knowledge about governance. It's knowledge about anything to do with culture, any kind of discipline that we have in Western knowledge, you have to expand beyond just thinking about it as an indigenous environmental knowledge to knowledge about how we should make decisions in a good way, knowledge about how we should treat the environment in a good way. So those are just a few of the things. And many of these elders have probably multiple PhDs in what they know. So again, I'm just humbled by the fact that they have shared some of those things with me. You're a Canada research chair, and yet, you know, something you heard 10 years ago is just making sense now. And it shows the deep knowledge and understanding that Indigenous people have of their environment, of their culture, of of where they live, and how important it is for we Canadians to really not only listen, but to really begin to incorporate it in the work that we do. Just shifting gears a little bit, in 2018, the University of Manitoba was designated as the United Nations Academic Impact Hub for Sustainable Development Goal number six, clean water and sanitation. 
your co-chair of this working group. And can you tell us uh, just a few things that are maybe coming from this that are really exciting you? Yeah, so I co-chair this group with someone named Claire Herbert, also from the Faculty of Environment. One of my favorite things about being at U of M, honestly, is co-chairing that group. Water and the water challenges that we face in Canada, as well as globally, are, are super complex. No single disciplinary perspective can start to get at fully understanding them. So I think something that's unique about the group is that we are truly interdisciplinary. We represent researchers from many not all, but many of the faculties across campus, including social scientists, humanities scholars, engineers, microbiologists. So, and as you may know, we don't always understand each other. So it's about building relationships and beginning to kind of unpack these complex problems around water. So I think one of the things that we're doing that both helps build those relationships, but also to helps us to share our knowledge across campus is a new speaker series that we started this year called The Last Drop. So it's called The Last Drop Water Researchers Speaker Series, and we have six talks this year. And it's all researchers who are involved in the group sharing various aspects of their work. It's a virtual seminar series, so I think four of them have happened so far, but there's videos of them and they all live online if people are interested, and we have two more coming up. But just this idea that we are working together to transcend disciplinary silos to better understand water problems. I think the second thing that's really exciting that is part of that group is just the way that researchers in the group are very much centering Indigenous peoples, Indigenous scholars who are faculty here, as well as Indigenous partnerships. And so that seems to be a common thread across most people's research. And you don't necessarily see that in some other groups. So there's people like Merle Ballard, Miguel Uyaguari, and Carrie Miller are all involved in the group. And all three of them actually did talks in the seminar series. And so beyond just interdisciplinary knowledge, we have these perspectives in the group. And we're working to learn more about this and bring what we've learned in the group to an international scale, actually, right now as well. So University of Manitoba was accredited to go to the United Nations 2023 Water Conference in New York in March. So we're looking forward to going and attending and uh, with the specific goal of bringing the perspective that Indigenous peoples need to be part of those global water conversations. To be honest, right now, Indigenous peoples at the United Nations are very much treated as any other stakeholder, not rights holders. And so I think it's an important message that our group can bring there. You just made a really important point, rights holders, which we hear often from First Nations and Indigenous people. And so can you tell us a little bit about the importance of that way of looking at the work you're doing, especially around water and land? When I'm talking about a rights holder, it's thinking about Indigenous peoples as having specific authorities, you know, in relation to water or other environmental things, or not just environmental. So when I'm thinking about rights holders, I'm thinking about people who have specific authorities related to governance. And stakeholders, by contrast, is a broader concept that includes anybody who might have some kind of interest in an issue. And so stakeholders are, are, of course, all really important, but that could include industry. It could include youth. It could include things like that. But I think centering the language of rights holders acknowledges that Indigenous peoples are, are not necessarily just equal to any other stakeholder, but have specific authorities. And as settlers, it's very threatening, in, you know, for many in viewing it that way, because we have to give up rights mm -hmm. or rights that we think we have. And when it comes to water, I think we continue to hear this over and over again from Indigenous nations that we, we really do have to take a different approach. Is there anything individuals can do who want to be part of the progress? Yeah, I think there's a lot that individuals can do. I think it starts with educating ourselves. So there's this phrase, truth and reconciliation, but people say truth before reconciliation. So how can we imagine, you know, advancing reconciliation if we ourselves don't know or haven't educated ourselves on what has really happened? So I think for individuals, I would recommend, you know, starting by, you know, looking at the work that the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada did, volumes of work documenting colonial histories that I think we need to learn about. And it is there and it's accessible to us. So I think that's something that I would recommend to people. 
I also think educating ourselves about what it is that Indigenous peoples want. And so that's a very complex topic, of course, but you could start by reading the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Just read through it. It's very powerful. There's many statements in there that I think we can learn from and our government has signed on. It took a few years, but uh, the government of Canada uh, did eventually sign on to the, they call it UNDRIP. And so I think for citizens to learn about what the principles of that are, what Indigenous peoples are expressing, uh, you know, as desires through that declaration, and then to look at what our government is actually doing. Is it in line with those? And so we have the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act, where the federal government is supposed to be implementing UNDRIP. And so I encourage people to just be paying a lot of attention to what is actually happening you know, with that act, with the implementation of it in Canada. And having read the declaration, people can better make sure that the government's actually uh, living up to that. So finally, and you have kind of touched upon it a little bit, what role do you think the University of Manitoba has in helping Canada respect Indigenous rights and relationships with water? I think the University of Manitoba can play an important role in advancing reconciliation in water governance by centering Indigenous self-determination and partnerships in our research programs. I think we're seeing a shift and I hope to see more of it of hiring more Indigenous scholars into the university to really bring that perspective. Like I said, I'm a settler researcher and I can bring a certain perspective, but what's really important is to have Indigenous peoples doing that work, their own communities. So yeah, I think we can provide a space to look at really innovative governance models as well. I really want to thank you for taking the time today, Nicole. It was a very enlightening conversation. I think the work you're doing around water governance is really important, but also the approach you've taken to research, the community-based approach where it's not just to come and do your research and then leave forever, but really to work with communities on the issues that they're facing and, and how the work that you do can help advance the goals of Indigenous communities in the Arctic. So I want to thank you for that, and I want to thank you for sharing uh, your thoughts with us today. Thanks so much for having me, Michael. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening to another episode of What's the Big Idea with University of Manitoba President and Vice Chancellor Michael Benarash. Be sure to join us next month for more conversations with today's big thinkers. If you enjoyed this episode, share it with a friend and make sure to subscribe, rate, and review the series. Thanks again for listening and be sure to visit umanitoba.ca to learn more about this leading research university and its global impact.